On this episode of Under the Radar Michigan, we're on Harsons Island for the island life, Michigan style. We'll also learn about its incredible history and go back to school for a great meal. Then we head to Grand Rapids for a dwelling place urbanites will love. We'll also meet one of the new generation of craftsmen and visit a downtown market that will change the way you eat, buy, and even think about food. Get ready to explore the cool people, places, and things that make Michigan a great place to be. Under the Radar Michigan is brought to you in part by the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, investing in people, places, and partnerships to help transform Michigan and the Michigan economy. In cities, towns, and neighborhoods, people are building better places to live and better communities. The Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure series raises funds and awareness in the breast cancer fight, celebrates survivorship, and honors those who have lost their battle. Everyone is welcome. Find a Komen Race for the Cure in more than 140 cities at Komen.org. And by Big B Coffee, celebrating 18 years as a Michigan company. Gift cards, mugs, and coffee by the pound available in store and online. Franchise info available at BIGGBY.com. I've been around the world, but there's one place I keep coming back to. And the more I explore, the more I realize it's the place to be. I'm Tom Dalton, and this is Under the Radar Michigan. Parsons Island. I've heard about it, seen pictures of it, I even know people who have been there. But now, it's my turn. The people here call it paradise. And if you're a fan of a laid-back lifestyle, that's exactly what Harsons Island is. It's 16 square miles of unspoiled nature, beautiful waterways, historic homes, and comfy cottages. And with only about 2,000 people living here year-round, it really is small-town island living, Michigan style. Harsons Island is located at the top of Lake St. Clair, just a one-hour drive northeast of Detroit. If you want to drive your car to Harsons Island, there's only one way to do it, and this is it. That's right, unless your car can swim, it'll have to catch a ride on Champion's Auto Ferry. These workhorses run year-round and around the clock, and the ride is just a short five minutes across the North Channel from neighboring Algonac. Dave Bryson's family's been getting people on and off this island for generations now. So, these ferries run 24-7? That's correct. Non 24 hours a day, every day of the year, nonstop, even during the winter. When do these guys sleep? They don't, they're not allowed to sleep. That's <laughs> forbidden. Now your family's owned these ferries for how long? Well, my grandfather started this operation back in 1937 when he bought an existing ferry. At that time, there were three or four other ferries and they all competed with each other. Of course, back in those days, the ferries weren't steel like they are now. They were wooden barges that were just pushed back and forth by regular boats. And after he bought the ferry, over a period of three or four years, why he actually went and built a steel ferry that put safe diesel power in it. And because it wasn't prone to blowing up like all the other wooden, you know, the wooden boats that were uh, fueled with gasoline, eventually he put everybody else out of business. Yeah, you wonder back then how many times the ferry break down and you just you just coast down river and just see you. Have a nice day. That was it. I mean, Sorry. If, if, if the boat or launch that was pushing you back and forth failed, why, you were on your own. That was it. What do you guys do in the winter? Does this freeze over? This freezes over hard and solid. Uh, normally, we'll let the ice come in and it jams up and freezes, and then we'll break a path through it. And then, because we run 24 7, we just keep the path open by going back and forth. What's the biggest challenge of running a ferry operation like this? There are two basic things that we have to take care of that are really problematic for us. One is finding enough qualified captains to run it 24 hours a day, every day of the year. That coupled with the mechanical aspect of keeping the boats mechanically in shape to, and, and sa the safety aspect of hauling people back and forth, especially through the ice that we have to do. Why, that, that's the two big things that's we spend most of our time on. Do uh, you think I could be a captain? No. Uh, maybe, well, can I collect some money from some people? Oh, sure, you can do that. <laughs> that I can do, I can count, I think. Well, before I knew it, Dave had me hard at work collecting fares. 
and I found out pretty quick that this job is almost as much fun as being a TV show host, but much more lucrative. Hi, I'm collecting money for the ferry. It's um, $47, please. $86, please. If you don't have any money, I'll take candy. $146, please. Did you want a car wash with your ferry ride today? Today it's by the person. One, two, three, four, five, seven, 18 people. That'll be $11 billion, please. Is this your first time in Mackinac Island? Did they tell you about the new ferry schedule? This is the last yeah. one till spring. You can't get off the ferry if you don't pay. This is Monopoly money. I got a pepper bit. Hot dog, thanks. You're good to go. You're good to go. Well, after leaving Dave with a mess of wrong change and crumpled up candy wrappers, we drove off the ferry and made our way across the island to the South Channel. Now, this is where the giant freighters pass so close to you, you can almost reach out and touch them. It's also where we discovered the tiny town of San Susi. Now, if you're looking for a walkable town, you can't do better than this. It's a wee town, all right, but it's got everything you need for a fun day on the island. You can grab a bite to eat at the historic San Susi restaurant, pack a picnic lunch at the San Susi market, and even find everything from cool island trinkets to incredible artistic treasures at the waterfront shop. It's a great place to explore and learn more about the island from the locals. And speaking of learning more, you know, if you want to find out more about a place, a great place to start is at the beginning. I wrote that myself, you like that? It's good, thanks. Here at the Harsons Island Historical Museum, I met up with Bernard Licata, who gave me a quick look back at the island. So this was actually used to be a fire station. This was the fire department for the island. For the whole island? Because it's for not very big. Well, it's not very big, but we only had one little fire engine here. Well, now, how long have you had this as a museum? We rented the building in March of 2011, and we opened the museum Memorial Day that year. Now, a lot of people know that Harsons Island is a great place to go to vacation, to relax. It's a great place to live. But a lot of people don't know that the great history this island's got. Oh, it's huge. Uh, back in the early days here on the island, well, it goes all the way back to Jacob Harson, who bought the island from the natives. And uh, he was the first white settler here. And then in early 1900s, when they switched over from sailing vessels to steamships, they uh, used to bring the Tajmu steamer up through here every day. The Tajmu steamer uh, carried some 3,000 passengers. It started at Wood, foot of Woodward in Detroit, and it hit all the hotels along the way, including the park that was on the island, the Tajmu Park, where there was entertainment and gambling and all sorts of good fun. And then it would make its way up to the Grand Point Hotel at the head of the island, and then it would go all the way to Port Huron, turn around and come back for the day. 3,000 people. That's how many it carried. So this was like a, a Mackinac Island of the South. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, it was amazing. The Harsons Island Historical Museum really is a great place to get lost in the island's illustrious past. But I was also curious what life was like on the island today. So I spent some time with Artie Bryson. He's the township supervisor here, and he's an islander through and through. For somebody who's never been to Harsons Island, explain the atmosphere or the culture here. Um, it's fairly unique. It's uh, laid back. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a different way of life. Like in the mm -hmm. summertime, there's boating and uh, kayaking, that sort of thing. One of the favorite things my wife and I, my kid, like to do, we grab an inner tube, we walk a half mile up to town, jump in, and we float down the river. And float back to your house. Float back to our house. <laughs> <clears throat> sometimes we grab a cocktail, sometimes not. <laughs> well, the neat thing is it's, like you were saying before, it's an hour from Detroit, and when you take that five minute ferry ride, that's your three hour drive up north. Exactly. It's, you're instantly up north. Exactly. And people that live over here, they, they're proud and they have a sense of ownership. A lot of people will tell you this is my island because they feel that way. Did you grow up on the island? I did. I did. Did you move away? I did for a while, yep. And uh, couldn't wait to get back. It only took a few minutes of conversation with Artie for me to realize what was so special about this island. Too bad Gilligan didn't get marooned here. I think he would have dug it the most. Well, now that I'm becoming an expert on the island, I should probably spend some time off the island and on the water. So my good friend, Captain Dave Barron and his first mate, Marty Pecklow, took us on a boat tour of the South Channel. Now this is where you really get a feel for how special this island is. Beautiful homes right on the channel and an international waterway is your playground. The trip up and down the channel was thrilling and relaxing all at the same time. It was at that moment I realized, you know, I could totally live here. And who knows, maybe someday. Well, as you can probably imagine, all that boating made us hungry. 
So we decided it was time to get educated on where to eat on the island. Now, usually the thought of going back to school sends chills up my spine, but not this time. And that's because this little schoolhouse is actually a restaurant. It's the Schoolhouse Grill, and until 2005, it was a real island elementary school. In 2009, Kristen Bain reopened the school as a place where she could show the whole world just how much she's learned about the fine art of good food. You have done an incredible job with this place. I mean, it's still schoolhouse, but it's so eclectic and weird. Where'd you get all this stuff? This is mostly hand-me-downs and garage sale and things, you know, we just used what we had. Well, some people can throw stuff together and it looks like they threw stuff together. That's me. And then there's people <laughs> like you that can take stuff like this and make it kind of work and turn it into a yeah. theme. A little art background. I guess maybe that's where it comes from. And I remember growing up, my house uh, always looked like this. It was always an eclectic mix of mm. things, you know, that my mom had collected. And um, I'm used to doing that, so. Now, this place was an actual working school not that long ago. No, 2005 it closed. Yeah. Wow. And I remember while it was going through that transition of what, whether they were going to keep it open or not, we were um, on the island with a, another location. And we you know, fought alongside parents wanting this to stay open because it was such a treasured school, you know, and so many memories here. But So you get people coming in here to eat that actually went to school? Here. Yeah, and taught here. Um, the stories have been just awesome to hear. I've had teachers come through here and cry and just so happy that we that we did something to it, you know, and that it didn't sit vacant. Well, time for this class clown to find out just how the regular folks feel about this elementary eatery. So what do you think with uh, what they did with the school here? Uh, the school? I was principal here. You were the principal? Oh my god, yes, I tell you. You still got your paddle? Great. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I do. This restaurant, we are so fortunate to have it right here on our little island. It's very spectacular, actually. It's the, the little island get-together gathering place. Just great. It's done a fabulous job. Great food, great service, really nice people. It's just a great time. They have the best food on the whole island, and there's no place better to come to. Did you go to school here? No, I did not. But do you like going to school here now? Oh, I love going to school here now, yes. Did you serve yep. food this good to the kids? Uh, better. Oh, no. uh, yeah. better. <laughs> Kristen is keeping the history of this great little schoolhouse alive for all the islanders to enjoy. She's also serving up the kind of fresh local food we totally love on UTR. Bonus. How would you describe the food that you're serving here? Um, I guess we, we call it American with a twist. I put a lot of Pacific Rim influence on it. Um, we do as much local eating as we possibly can um, out of the garden, you know, we were talking before about no recipes. Mm. Just go in there and, you know, use what you have and put it together and make great things come out of the kitchen, so. There's not going to be a pop quiz on any of this, is there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some study time for you. Well, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to stay after school and have some dinner. Do you mind? Not at all. Okay, good. <laughs> well, our first meal at the schoolhouse grill totally passed the test, and so did our first visit to Harson's Island. So next time you're up for a uniquely Michigan island adventure, spend a day here. And who knows, someday you just might pass me in my cozy little cottage. Just uh, don't forget to wave. I've said it before and I'll say it again. When was the last time you were in Grand Rapids? As a matter of fact, have you ever been to Grand Rapids? Well, if you haven't, spend a day here and I guarantee you'll love it. And if you don't, I'll come to your house and make you pancakes. But because you don't like Grand Rapids, no syrup. Grand Rapids continues to be one of our favorite places to visit on UTR. If you like a city that's alive with great food, culture, sports, education, and innovation, Grand Rapids is a place you just might want to live. It's a big city that's kept that small town sense of place, and it's attracting young people from across the country to help move it forward. It's a city on the move and in all the right directions. Grand Rapids is located in the middle part of Michigan's Mitten, just 20 miles due east of Lake Michigan. If you had a company that created great affordable spaces for all kinds of people to live and work right downtown, what would you call it? I've got an idea. How about Dwelling Place? Denny Sturdivant is the CEO at Dwelling Place, and he's the man with the urban plan to revitalize downtown Grand Rapids and its surrounding neighborhoods. So Denny, tell me if I got this right. Uh, the Dwelling Place isn't an actual place. It's a collection of places that creates a sense of place for the community. Right. Dwelling Place has uh, more than 27, well, 28 properties now across four counties, six communities. 
um, over 1,300 housing units, about 150,000 square feet of commercial spaces uh, in uh, 46 separate commercial uh, locations. Uh, so it's a lot of things over spread over a large area. A lot of it is concentrated, though, in downtown Grand Rapids. Right. Well, what you're doing for, you're doing stuff for the elderly, for special needs people, and creating live workspace uh, and retail space here in town. Yeah, we, we lease space to Huntington Bank, Grand Rapids Community College, Calvin College, Grand Valley State University. We have market rate live workspaces. We have rent uh, restricted live workspaces. Uh, we have special needs pro uh, programs for people who are disabled or are homeless. And then we have everything in between. What's the main philosophy of Dwelling Place? Well, Dwelling Place is, the mission of Dwelling Place is really three parts. It's creation of really high quality, affordable housing, providing support services for those who need them. And that doesn't mean those just with special needs. We do a lot of stuff with our artists, trying to provide supports for them because they know they are really good, but maybe they need a little help with the business side of it, so we do a lot of that. And then um, a large part of it, and that's why we get into all this neighborhood stuff, is to serve as a catalyst for neighborhood revitalization. The neat thing about your target is you're creating space and a place for everyone in the community, not just a certain niche group. Mm -hmm. So you, it's good for the whole community. Yeah, and I like to take part of the credit. I think that we've had great support from the city of Grand Rapids, and so it, it's a great process that involves lots and lots of people, but to have a strong neighborhood, you have to have a neighborhood that works for everything and everybody. Let's face it, everyone in our society deserves a sense of place in the community where they live, and the dwelling place is just the place to make that happen. You know, there's a lot of old sayings out there that I really love, like, don't count your chicken till it's cooked, um, fight fire with water. Uh, oh, and my favorite, a bird in the hand is worth its weight in gold. But the one I never got was, what's old is new again, at least not till I met this guy. Meet Victor Sultana, a young guy who took an old craft and turned it into Victor Axe and Tools, a brand new company that takes the age old art of working with your hands and handcrafts quality tools. Now, you're a pretty young guy, not far out of college. Did you ever think that you'd be in your garage starting a company that's getting worldwide acclaim now, building axes? Uh, the first part, probably, or I would hope. Uh, you know, I've, ever since I was in high school, I was kind of building small businesses either with friends or by myself, and uh, I've always wanted to have something that had to, that people would know about, uh, but I never imagined that it would be axes, and especially with uh, really all my roles and careers have all been in technology. Uh, it seems very backwards, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> but I love it. It's, uh, it gives me that thing I get to do at the end of the day where uh, when I'm at a company where I get to do one very small portion of something, which is also very rewarding, I get to come back and take something from start to finish, and it's totally my own, and it's totally everywhere that I want it to be. Because you are your staff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How did you get interested in reclaiming old uh, blades? Uh, yeah, so there, that's how it started was, so I built that handle, and I was getting close to the end, but I knew I needed to outfit it with a head, obviously, and it didn't make sense for me to buy a new one, cut off the handle, and put mine on. And so I went on eBay and was seeing if I could find a used axe head, and there was tons of them. And so I built that first one, shared pictures of it with people, and it just had great feedback, and so I kind of never stopped. There was something about uh, a tool in, a day and age that we're in, uh, that you can refurbish it, you can bring it back to life, it's not dead, you don't throw it away. Um, and so that's kind of what kept me doing it, just because you can breathe some new life back into them. Well, is there something better about these old blades than the newer ones? There is, there is. So uh, even though there's a lot of American-made names that are still on them, uh, most of them are made offshore or down in Mexico. Um, and the steel isn't either tempered or it's just not the same type of quality steel that we used to use, uh, and, or they're cast and they're not drop forged. I just think it's neat that a young guy like you is handcrafting things like this, that a lot of us, like you said, they buy stuff, factory stuff sometimes made out of the country. Yeah. The quality's low, they don't last very long. And you don't know any different sometimes. <laughs> like you use true. it and... Uh... True, but I mean, you're, you're making things the way they were made a long time ago, but they're gonna last a long time. Definitely, and that's kind of the the core of uh, where I've seen the business go is uh, it's exciting to make things that are going to do what they're supposed to today in the best possible way, uh, but then they could be handed down or used for years and they'll work in that same fashion. What's cool is we're, we're, I can tell we're, we're catching you at the genesis of this entire project because obviously we're in your garage that you've turned into this workshop. Yep. What do you see for your future with this whole thing? 
Honestly, I try and take it one step at a time. I mean, obviously you're always thinking about that and it never is growing fast enough for me. You know, every time we get a little bit of uh, media blitz or anything like that, it's like, oh, that was awesome, but you know, how do we get the next one? Or uh, what is that next tool and you want to speed it along? But uh, it's important to take the time with each one and not to relate it to the axis, but I've learned that as well. You know, you can't rush the process. So as long as we take care of the things that we're working on right now, I think it will inevitably bring some good things for us. So that's the best answer I can give you right now. Youth and innovation always seem to go hand in hand, and Victor Sultana is the personification of that. Whether you fancy yourself a lumberjack or not, you can't help but admire what's happening at Victor Axon Tool World Headquarters. Have you unfortunately developed a taste for freezer burn? Yeah, me too. Well, I've got a revolutionary old idea for you that's gonna save both of us. It's called shopping local and buying fresh often. And the best new place to do that in these parts is the Grand Rapids Downtown Market. It's a state-of-the-art facility that takes the old concept of the farmer's market way into the new millennium. Mimi Fritz is the CEO here, and she explained how the market is bringing fresh and artisan foods to urbanites across the city. We've discovered from doing this show that people all over Michigan are reconnecting with their downtowns and their cities, and a market like this is so perfect for that. How, how long have you guys been here now? We opened um, to the public on September 1, so just a short time now. Oh, so you just opened? We did, but the process to get open was many years. I was going to ask you, wasn't there a farmer's market here like 100 years yes, ago? Yes, yes, there was. So initially the idea was that we were going to preserve the buildings and be able to use them to build the market in, but that didn't happen after we did a lot of testing and they just weren't structurally sound. So they all had to come down, unfortunately. And what we did, though, is we used a lot of the old buildings. So any of the wood you see yeah. is actually wood from the buildings that were here before. And then as much of the buildings that we could grind up, we ground up, and it's the uh, first layer of asphalt underneath that in our parking lot. So the buildings are kind of still here. I would love to have a market like this close to me. It, it's funny, it took me going to Europe and seeing how the Europeans deal with food to change my philosophy on food. Every day you'd see them stopping by a little market on their way home, picking up something fresh to have for dinner that night as opposed to pulling something out of a freezer, unwrapping it out of cellophane and cooking it. Right. And that's why markets like this are helping the whole food movement, food culture, the agricultural culture, um, and it's helping cities it's help, just helping people live in cities. And, and the core of the cities as well, because in this area, there wasn't really any place to buy food or groceries, especially fresh or local. So this really fills a void to all the people who live not only downtown, but in the surrounding areas as well. They don't have to get in a car and drive 15 miles to a grocery store. For you personally, what's the most rewarding thing about doing this? I would say that it's the, the smiles that I see on people's faces. Um, there was a lot of work and a lot of years that went into this project, and it just, it's, it's great to walk around and see somebody enjoying themselves. You know why there's smiles on their faces? Because you're putting good food in their tummies. Oh. Nice job. Thank you. The Grand Rapids City Market is so much more than a market. It's a place for the community to meet, learn, shop, and share. Every city should have a market like this one, and everyone should come to Grand Rapids because it's a city that's taking the solid traditions of the past and turning them into a brighter future for all of us. And I like that. You know, when I'm out driving around the state, well, actually, Jim does all the driving, I like to occasionally check into utrmichigan.com. And you should, too. You can watch previous episodes, use our visitor's guide to get more information about places we've been. You can jump to our Facebook page. You can tell us where to go next and even get a hat like mine. So go to utrmichigan.com. That's utrmichigan.com. Can't talk now. I got more exploring to do. Jim, take her away. Under the Radar Michigan is brought to you in part by the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, investing in people, places, and partnerships to help transform Michigan and the Michigan economy. In cities, towns, and neighborhoods, people are building better places to live and better communities. The Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure series raises funds and awareness in the breast cancer fight celebrates survivorship, and honors those who have lost their battle. Everyone is welcome. Find a Komen Race for the Cure in more than 140 cities at Komen.org. And by Big B Coffee, celebrating 18 years as a Michigan company. 
Gift cards, mugs, and coffee by the pound available in store and online. Franchise info available at B-I-G-G-B-Y dot com. 